Hey, what's up? What's happening, y'all? Hey, hey, BG in the building. We want to send a quick shout out to our girl Desiree. Right in the mood by the music on Sheen Magazine. We appreciate it. We love you. Good life. The new power generation, the iconic, legendary, and incredible band that continues to keep their legacy alive with amazing energy and music that pays homage to Prince. I had the pleasure of speaking with Morris Hayes, Tony M, and the newest member, Mackenzie, about their history, their memories of Prince, and their friendship, including some really funny stories. We also talked about what's next for them and their upcoming tour dates. Morris Hayes, Tony M, and Mackenzie. It's so nice to have you on my show today. Oh, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Yeah, first and foremost, congratulations on all of your success. You guys are all musical geniuses. And gosh, I have so many questions I want to ask you. So for for each of you to briefly explain and take us back a little bit. And okay, kind of I'm explain a, I'm a, to wait everybody. A minute, Desiree, Desiree, I'm going to say, girl, you need to cut it out. Oh, no, he's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, how, that's what I consider you, and you have all such right. a long history that you guys are, are all musical geniuses. So I love that I'm able to talk to you and hear more about what you guys are doing. So I wanted you to explain a little bit to us about how each of you came to even be involved with music. Let's start with you, Morris. Well, I mean, you know, it's one of those things I always say when people say, like, what made you, you know, choose music? And I'm like, well, I didn't choose music. Music chose me kind of a thing. And so uh, I think at an early age, you know, I was going to church, and that was kind of my influence back in the day. Uh, I lived in the, I lived pretty much in the world. I grew up in the country. So uh, I, I listened to a lot of radio, but the thing is that the, the radio that played the, you know, got me to the AM station back in the day, and uh, it didn't come in very well. I was kind of far from the station. And so what sounded really good was the FM stations. And they would, you know, they were, back in that time, there was no black FM stations in Arkansas. So I, I actually listened to a lot of rock and roll and a lot of different things. So I just had a very wide musical palette, you know. Uh, and I really, it, it, it ended up serving me well. Of course, you know, Prince was very much a diverse artists in terms of like the styles that he would approach with rock and roll and punk and you know all kinds of genres you know so that was a, I think was a good lead into the situation of Prince. Yeah definitely I mean did you grow up you know even though you grew up in the country I mean were you one of those you know kids that was you know practicing in front of the camera or what were you doing or how did you even involve yourself in wanting to be a performer? Yeah, you got me twisted, man. We didn't have cameras. I grew up in the 60s. So, so, a camera was something I saw with the white folks with on television. <laughs> so it was like, uh, you know, I, to be honest, I mean, music really wasn't my thing. Like when I was a kid, as much, you know, I uh, was mostly in the art. And I, I, wanted, I wanted to play sports. I wanted to play football and play basketball and stuff like this. And my, mm-hmm. my youngest brother, he was kind of more into music than I was, but uh, it was just something. And we had a piano at home, and so, you know, I stepped on it, and, you know, it got to be something I could do a little bit and be at church. But it was like a secondary, tertiary type of thing. It wasn't really my main focus of being a musician, but that didn't really happen until I got into college, where I really said, like, wow, I think I could do this music thing. I had an art scholarship. So uh, it was kind of different for me. I, I just remember, I, I think the thing that, sticks to me the most is that I recall just the way I listen to music, there's certain things appeal to me. I didn't understand why, uh, but I could hear certain things. And, and when I would hear things that moved me, I, I don't know, it was just like a key. It was just like a something in the music that would make me just go like perk up, go like, wow, like if I was just to Ohio players and just the way that the roads or well, something was mixed or something, I just noticed sound. I just noticed and I, how I heard things. And when I heard things, sound great that always appealed to me and so right. it's kind of like having a superpower that you don't really know you got yet you know that i could hear stuff and then i could repeat it so if i played something if i heard it i could i could repeat that and so that's just kind of the way it was you know i just uh and i kind of grew into it once i got in like high school and like college and when i got to college that's when i got to the real cast that really 
doing mm-hmm. it. You know, I used to pass by the the building and the rooms and see them in there practicing, and they were getting it in. So I was like, wow, I like this music thing, man. And that's when it really started to shift. Uh, Bill Clinton was um, running for governor at the time. And we got a gig for one of his uh, campaign speeches. Like, we got a gig to go and play one of his uh, campaign uh, functions. And uh, and our real keyboard player in the band had quit. He had to, like, get down to his study. And they said, well, you know, uh, you've been fronting, but now we got to do this gig for Bill Clinton. He's, you know, he's running for governor. <laughs> and we got this gig. And so now you actually have to learn all the music, do all the songs. And I was like, uh-oh. Because I was just kind of fronting and just like, you know, waving to the girls. And so um, <laughs> for me, I had to then go learn all of that music that we were actually doing and kind of pull off that gig by myself. And, uh, and, and I did. And it was like, it, it, was, it was kind of rocky, but I got there. And I think that was the start. And it was like, wow, I could do this. You know, I could really do this. And uh, I, that's when my interest, I think, began to shift into uh like really wanting to play and, and looking at that as a serious thing that I wanted to do. Wow. Thank you for explaining that more. It's kind of interesting because, you know, like you said, you know, music found you, you know, instead of you finding it, you know, it came into your life in a certain way and it found you and you've had great success. So thank you for, for sharing that with everybody. And what about you, um, Tony M? How did you come into involving yourself with music? Uh, I would have to, have to go back to an early age. I remember my my mother always said that, boy, if music came on, you just moved, and even when I was a baby. And my earliest recollection was probably uh, my very first concert, which was a James Brown concert uh, that my mother took me to. And, um, you know, at the time back then, he would bring kids up on stage. I happened to be one of the lucky kids who got pulled up on stage and hit my best James Brown impersonation. And... Um, <laughs> So that was my first, you know. I think, that's crazy, you know, Tone. Uh, I want to see a picture of that. That, that. That's that's crazy, Tone, because you know what? I think that was my first concert, man. My mom, my brother, he was, he, he, he was turning 17. Yeah, and he man. went to a James Brown concert probably around the same time he was on that tour. Bro, that's, I, I don't think I ever knew that story, <laughs> Tony. That just, just freaked me out, man. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, man. You Wait, man. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. That's just crazy, though. That's, that's don't crazy. Worry, man. About, remember he was. He did that. He pulled kids up on stage. He did it when I was there. Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah, sir. Wow. That would be sir, something so if you guys were at the same concert, though. <laughs> oh no, no. I, I saw him in Little Rock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that was my first. I mean, again, I I, I kind of grew up just you know uh, loving music. I was the I was the kid in the family when we had family reunions and. You know, some James Brown or whatever came on, I'd be the one to entertain the whole family as they would, you know, sip their beers and their little, you know, irk and jerk or whatever they needed to do and, you know, be Tony <laughs> entertaining the family. And um, so, again, impersonating, you know, uh, certain entertainers uh, with that broomstick in front of a mirror by yourself just to, you know, I didn't really think it was going anywhere. Again, I was I was like Mo. I was, uh, I was grooming – myself to be a football basketball player I was all in the sports it was all about that you know wow. and uh, I, I grew up uh, in North Minneapolis well I migrated from the Bronx New York to North Minneapolis and when I grew up grew up in the era where uh, like so Jerome Benton yeah, him and I grew up in the projects together his brother Terry Lewis used to be my assistant pop Warner football coach so I grew up around all these amazing musicians and and, and watching the Battle of the Bands with Grand Central Prince and Morris and then the time with Terry Lewis, uh, Sonny Thompson and the family. So I grew up as a shorty around all these individuals and, and just watching them from year to year and just cultivate. And, you know, and, and to be honest with you, I don't even know if they, they knew they were cultivating a sound. They were just doing their own thing, you know, woodshedding. And, and in Minnesota back in the early 70s, I think as like most stated, you know, there weren't any black radio stations. There weren't even black, uh, venues where black artists could go and perform. So, you know, all you had all you had to do was a uh, woodshed and, 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 and learn your craft. And then mm-hmm. when the summertime came and uh, Spike Moss used to do the local Battle of the Bands or festivals, that's when we got an opportunity to play. So you had all winter. If it gets cold as all get out here, you had all winter to uh, – to woodshed and learn your songs, get your set together. When the summertime happened, oh, man, you had your outfits ready, you were ready to roll. So, uh, you know, kind of growing up in that era uh, is kind of when it, you know, really started to happen for me. I, um, 
my my first I was in the Marine Corps for about six years, and then uh, I was in my last year of, uh, of reserve duty, and uh, I went down to First Avenue with a friend of mine, Damon Dixon, who's also in the band, and we did a dance contest down there, and uh, we won for like six or seven weeks straight, and uh, Prince happened to be down there, and they were looking for extras for Purple Rain. So my first jump off of Prince was uh, Purple Rain. He was the guy who asked us to make up like seven songs to like Bird, Jungle Love, Computer Blue, I mean, you name it. We made up like seven routines in my mom's apartment uh, from about 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. It had to be on set the next day. And uh, we recorded all these routines. So that was when Prince gave us our first opportunity. And um, that, that was kind of the jump off for me. That is awesome. Wow. That was one of my questions for you too, Tony, about, you know, you spending some time in the military and Mm -hmm. um, when you first met Prince and how you guys met. So thank you for explaining that. That was really neat. Did any of your military, you know, training or experience or things that you learned prepare you for what you were going to be into with Prince? Um, You know, really just discipline. Absolutely. From a discipline uh, standpoint, understanding hierarchy, and uh, being able to deal with rejection. If you're going to come into this business, you're going to get a whole hell of a lot of no's before you get a yes, right? So, and it was, uh, you know, it was about preparation, right? So, again, uh, Purple Rain was our jump off. We thought that's when it was going to happen. It didn't. It was years down the road. It allowed me to continue to work my craft and uh, learn other things like playing guitar, uh, writing song lyrics, and things of that nature. So then when Mm -hmm. my opportunity did come with Prince, I was prepared. Right, so right. not only you know being you know being ready, but you got to be prepared to take advantage of the opportunity when it when it does come around. That is awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's an amazing history. What about you, Mackenzie? You know, how did you get involved with music? Church, 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 and more church. Uh, <laughs> my family was very very religious growing up. Um, I was in church seven days a week. I probably sang at church four out of those seven days a week. Um, and that's not even counting the multiple services we would have on Sunday. But I was always around music. My father was a self-taught musician. He always was playing guitar, the piano, or singing something around the house. And then I just grew up, fortunately, around just some really amazing singers that just made me want to be or want to try, you know, to be like them. So I caught the bugs pretty early. I would say I started singing solos in church around two or three years old. And I've had a mic in my hand ever since then. Wow. I mean, and your voice is amazing. Congratulations on your success on um, Americans, America's Got Talent. You did a wonderful, wonderful mm-hmm. job. And I'm still, still blown away from that beautiful performance <laughs> you did uh, with nothing compared to you that you dedicated to your beautiful wife, Denise. That was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So with mm-hmm. all the fame that came with that and you being part of MPG, how have you – how have you stayed grounded through all of those things? Wow. Um, I don't really feel like I have a problem with that, and I think that goes back to just how I was raised. I don't really um, take my gifts for granted. I understand that it was given to me, and I'm just supposed to be a good steward over it. Um, and my job is to, you know, make people feel loved and make people smile and bring joy to people's hearts. So for me, it's a privilege. So whatever opportunity I'm blessed to have, I, I don't look at it as, oh, you know, I just did this or I just did that. Like, you can ask these guys. I'm on stage with what, – what, what are we going on? Are we going on almost two years, two years now that I've been playing with them? And I'm still standing there like a little kid in a candy store just in <laughs> awe of who they are. And just, you know, even how humble they are. Like, they've been to the mountaintop, mountaintop, you know. And these guys are still – like, Mo's still a student of music. Tony's still a student. He's still learning things. and. Stuff like that just inspires me and keeps me humble. And I also understand that, you know, it can be taken away from me at any moment. So right. it, as far as being grounded, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty grounded, I, I would say. Okay. I'll thank my mama for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, thank you for sharing how you grew up and, and your background. I had read that about you, that you grew up, um, you know, serenading the cows and things like that, which was interesting. I really yes, love to hear that. <laughs> That's a true story. People think people think that I'll make that up, but that's a true story. My, my younger brother and I, we would hold church services and actual concerts for about 100 to 200 cows, and they would just sit and watch us while we played and went through a whole show. That is awesome. <laughs> 
That is awesome. And I mean, it's obvious, you know, that, that Prince surrounded himself with top-notch musicians as, as yourself. MPG is amazing, Definitely. the best of the best. And he even referred to you guys as the best man ever. I mean, your style and the sound and the whole vibe that MPG has, it's, it's a class by itself. So what did you learn the most? Um, Morris, as a musician and as a friend um, when you were working with Prince? Well, of course, I've been there that long. It's, it's a lot that you learn from, from Prince, and I think one of the you know, things that always pops to mind when I get this question is there was a lot of things just as a musician uh, that everybody should know that he's been a master uh, uh, band leader. Uh, one of the things he always tell me, like, it's not a mistake until you stop. He's like, mm. you know, keep it moving. Uh, a lot of times people wouldn't, they won't know that you've done something unless you give it away, unless you look like there's something happening. He says, not a mistake until you stop. It's music. You know, uh, uh, you know there's a you know, times where Miles Davis and some of these guys are saying, like, when you're playing, you know, there's no bad notes. You just hit this note, but it's the next one. That one's going to be right. With the next one, and it's like you—it's all in how you approach it and and how you deal with it. And Prince was so good that he could make a mistake and repeat the mistake like he meant to do it, and you think that's what he meant to do. Yeah. That's what he, you know. That's the thing he could do. That was very cool about uh, his whole thing, and just just things of that nature, just about just how to just perform. And some of the old school just. Performers like the show must go on, and and that you have to just keep it keep it moving. You know, the crowd don't have to know what your situation is and all of the things. You came to see a good show. He always wanted you to respect the music. That was one of the biggest things for him: respect the music. Respect and if you do that, music. then you will win. So that was, awesome. I think, the biggest thing that I I took away from was just respect the music. And now, uh, if you do that, whether there's ten people or ten thousand to do the best show that you could possibly do and every time you pick up your instrument. Even when we were messing around. If I just got bored or just because Prince would jam for six hours, it ain't nothing for him. If you at the house and you just you and him playing and I'd be on drums. I don't even play drums. But I'd be playing and I'd just get <laughs> bored and switch the beat and be like, Why did you do that? And I was like, Well I just was then he'd get disgusted because he'd be like, If you don't play the drums, bro, play the drums. If not, don't get on them. It's just like Respect the instrument, respect the music. And you know, I, you know, I was messing around. I was like, we were just messing around. We're not even serious. But it was always serious then. Like, right. So right. That's the, that's the kind of thing that I think that I would bring to mind. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's the kind of vibe that he was on. And I, I love that you shared that, though, about respecting the music. And I think so many people, you know, take things for granted sometimes when you're in in so deep with the music and it's part of who you are, there's nothing really left to do but respect it. So I'm glad that you shared that. Um, Tony, what about you? What what did you take um, from the time that you worked with Prince? What was the um, biggest lesson or the biggest message that you received during that time? Um, I would have to say um, I, that there were no boundaries. There are no there are no ceilings. You know, I came in and uh, I just you know, dude, I'm a dancer. You know, and uh, then he found out I could play guitar and, and write lyrics. And he said, you know, you're not just a dancer from North Minneapolis. You're not just that brother from North Minneapolis. I mean, you you uh, I put you up front for a reason. And uh, you know, uh, I see something in you that you don't even see in yourself. So that that gave me a whole different view on how I was going to approach this thing. Again, we were just happy as being uh, backup dancers in the band. So uh, that opened my mind up to a whole other world and a whole other way of thinking. So I have to say he expanded my view uh, immensely just from that simple statement. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, Mackenzie, did you ever have a chance to meet Prince? So, unfortunately, no. I never got a chance to meet him, um, never got a chance to work with him. I left the club that he was coming into twice, but I didn't find that out until I got home and it was the next day. But, no, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to meet him. Um, but, obviously, he, was a, he still is a great musical influence on me. And just to echo what the guy is saying, his, his fearlessness, his freedom, his authenticity, like everything about him is 
what I feel every artist should strive to be. Like, he was a pure artist. And to this day, I'm still learning lessons from him. Yes, definitely. And, you know, that that brings me to this question about, you know, since you have, you didn't get a chance to meet him, but you um, you definitely are doing a great job um, with MPG. Do you do anything special, let's say, before a performance or something that kind of channel some of his energy or some type of ritual that you might do to just prepare yourself before you get off stage? A lot of prayer. Um, and that's before every show. It's because when you're on stage like that and you're opening yourself up to so many different energies, not just, you know, the energies that are in the room from the people that are there, but like you said, whatever energies you may be possibly channeling while you're performing. Um, so I always just pray a little protective prayer over myself and just remind myself that I'm McKenzie. And that's what I'm supposed to be. I'm not trying to be Prince. I'm not trying to be anybody else once I'm up there. Um, but, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I do every show. Okay. okay. Thank you for sharing that. I know that can, your know, prayer can bring some, some peace to the environment and peace to yourself, too, to get you ready to get out there and perform for everybody. So thank you for sharing Absolutely. that. So Morris and Tony, you've been all around the world and have a, have a ton of experience. What was one of the most <clears throat> memorable or funniest moments that has happened while you were on tour? Something that you could share with us. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> for, for, for me, it was uh, when we were in uh, Rio. Uh, we were doing Rock in Rio. And uh, the tour before that, we, had, uh, we were in Switzerland and we went to uh, Claude. Montour, who's the uh, basically the owner, start you know he started the the Montour Jazz Festival, and he let a, you know he invited us up to his place, and you know when we got up there for dinner and just kind of went through the video archives of all the people who had played there, he had fireworks and he had these uh, hand gliders out in front of his house, and he was gonna let us do hand gliding, you know, with you know, like tandem jumps with um, people over Lake Geneva, and we were just so excited about doing that. I, I was a bit of a daredevil, especially back then. And um, our uh, road manager uh, got wind of it and gave us a call and, and they put a squash on it and said, you guys, friends can't have you jumping off a cliff. And um, so I was a little <laughs> disturbed by that. And uh, we got to Rio, and I didn't say a word to anybody. And uh, I found uh, this guy would take me up to go hand gliding uh, when we were in Rio, and I went hand gliding. So... Uh, Felt good about it. It was great. It was the most, it was, man, it was the most exhilarating thing I had ever done. I get back to the hotel, and about an hour or so later, I get a phone call from uh, uh, Prince's brother, Dwayne. He said, hey, man, Prince wants to know if you'd like to stop up to the room. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. I just thought we were going to review some footage from the, uh, you know, from the show. Maybe he had yeah. some tips, some pointers, or, you know, maybe he was going to kick me down for punk night. He used to pay a few people for punk <laughs> night who were the punkiest. So I get up to his room, and, you know, he, uh, he's playing some music. He lets me listen to a, a new track that he wanted me to think about right to. And, and and I'm thinking that's it. And he says, oh, by the way, I heard you went hand gliding. I said, yeah, man, I did. I kind of froze. <laughs> right. And, uh, I kind of froze and, oh, no, here we go. He said, yeah. He said, was that fun? Did you enjoy yourself? I said, man, it was the most exhilarating thing I'd ever done. He said, oh, that's nice. That's nice. Was that $500 worth of fun? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if it was worth that. He said, well, that's what that's going to cost you, $500. So he docked me for that. <laughs> oh, uh, for that, man. For that, for that little jump off the cliff. But, you know, in the same breath, I, I, I did kind of explain to him, and, you know, I joked with him a little bit because, I used to, uh, you know, I, I I didn't call him Dracula. I called him Blackula, right? I said, man, <laughs> you, you go in and out of the back of tenant limos into the back of a hotel, into the back of a club. You know, you are not out here seeing anything. I said, man, have you been down to Ipanema yet? Have you checked out Copacabana? And, I, you know, I made him get up and, you know, uh, I had him pull the car around. They got the car, and we drove to Ipanema so he could go see the beach. I said, man, ain't this a beautiful thing out here? And you can imagine Rio, and you know, around that time, yeah. it's uh, it's 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 banging. So he he said, "Oh man, this is beautiful." And, you know, we got out. I said, "Come on, get on out the car." He said, "Okay, okay." And I jumped out and I got on the other side. And he rolled down the window just enough so I could see his eyes, and then he rolled it up and had the car pull off. And I'm like, "You dirty dog!" 
<laughs> and he, he stopped, but that was just that was the other side of him. He was such a jokester. It was, uh, right. It was the man loved to laugh. So he loved to laugh. Yeah. Wow, yeah. wow, that's a neat story. A very neat story. Neat, 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 neat. What about you, Morris? Well, uh, like like Tony was saying, Prince was a real punster. He, he, he liked to laugh. And, and, and honestly, you know, when people ask, what do you miss about Prince? I think the thing I miss about him most, uh, you know, as many shows we did, we did you know, the MGG, as I can say, we did a lot of touring, did a lot of shows. But, you know, man, just the decent hot part of the studio and just hearing him laugh and, we, you know, we poking fun at each other and, but Prince liked to play the dozens. We like to, you know, we, 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 that's what was cool about him, depending on which thing you catch him on. He'd be telling each other's moms and all kind of stuff, you know. And, and just and shoot basketball. You know, we all we used to play a lot of basketball back in the day. And, um, you know, that was just the kind of days of conditioning, plus, you know, yeah. just, just letting some steam off, you know. And, uh, but he liked to joke. He liked to laugh about stuff. And, I think, you know, there, there's so many, but one that pops to mind, uh, we were on tour, and um, we were down in Tampa, Florida, and um, uh, Prince liked to get the movies at, at night, you know, like, uh, like you, you have a day off or something, and, you know, rather than be sitting around in the room or something, he'd probably call, call, call some of the bad cats, and just run out of movie theaters, like, at, like midnight or something, like, and then we go to the movies, like, after hours. And Prince is notoriously late for a lot of stuff. Like, he'd be late, man, because he doesn't watch that. He'd just come when he feel like it. You know, everybody else got to be on time. So, you know, we show up at the little movie theater. It's like 12, 30, 1 o'clock. I remember it's this movie, this old long movie, I'm a star, man. It's like this movie about six hours, like three hour movie or something. And so we're sitting at the theater, man, and it's like, man, it's 1 o'clock. Now it's two o'clock. These dudes just come creeping in. You know, we was me and Kirk and like the bodyguards and a couple of us we in there kind of sleeping, waiting on him to get there. He creep in about three, and, and then he walks through the back door, like the exit door, you know, like the fire escape exit. Like, who's in here? And I just was like, your mama's in here, <laughs> you know. And everybody just broke up laughing. You know, everybody cracked up laughing. He's like, oh. Okay. So the next day is the concert. We at the arena, we had an arena like yeah, where they play basketball or whatever, you know, where they play hockey at. And we at the arena, and so you know, Prince is Prince, you know, he, he can go extra on his little, uh, on the get back, you know, he can go in extra. So we all sitting in the dressing room, you know, we all chilling and everything. All of a sudden, on the PA system, like that goes all over the arena, I hear. Uh, from some official Simon guy, like like with the, that that talks on the system normally, it wasn't yeah. Prince. It was somebody that that works there. He's all of a sudden said, uh, "Morris Hayes, uh, your mom is at the back gate looking for a uh, ticket for something like this." <laughs> and then, uh, and and we just we just in the room like what? Like yeah, your mom's <laughs> trying to get in at the back fence. And we was like, oh, no, like, and then Kirk just laid out because it was just like, oh, man, he's getting you back from yesterday, dude. Oh, my God. And he's God. got the dude, he's got the people from the arena. It's going all over the arena. People just laughing. And, and then uh, <laughs> there's a guy with his name, Mike Scott, and he said, Mike Scott, the, the uh, MGM uh, liquor truck is out back. I mean, it's just like he killed <laughs> us, like, in front of everybody, man. And it's just like, oh, no, we are the public address to like for the whole venue, <laughs> and it was uh, we was like looking crazy because we like we, like we can't punch him with Prince because he'll go up the next notch on you and there ain't nothing you can do. You just looking like clown. You got to, you got to toe up, you know. So that was real funny. It was like wow, he went in on us, man. Wow, <laughs> a lot, a lot of a funny moment. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a lot of stuff like that, but it, it you know it just was a lot of fun. I mean. It, yeah. it was a tough job. I mean, anybody that worked there for any length of time knows we worked hard, but we played mm-hmm. hard, too. So it was, it was really cool. Definitely. Definitely. That was funny. And Mackenzie, what about you? What's some of the, one of the most memorable moments you've had thus far or the funniest thing that has happened while you've been performing or touring or on stage or something like that that you could share? Um, I don't know if I want to share any of the funny moments. <laughs> they might not be appropriate. Uh, okay. But 
but I, I, I do remember those. Hey, but you're not killing about me running naked down the street. I, 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 I got you, bro. I ain't going, you know, I'm not going to let them know about that. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. I got you. Oh, my God. 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 Oh, my most memorable moment, though, would have to be the first time I met all these guys. Um, they had me fly out to Minneapolis, and I walked into the old Flight Time Studios. And I don't really think these guys understood that, like, I have been watching them for the better part of my life. So I was yeah. shook walking into that room. That's Morris Hayes on the keyboards. That's Levi Caesar on the guitar. That's Sonny Thompson on the bass. Tony M. and Damon Dixon are walking up to me like, what's, what's up, brother? It is, that is a funny moment I'll share because Damon to this day makes fun of me. When I first met Damon, I didn't give him like the, you know, like the brother dap, like, the, you know, I see you, bro, I see you. I put out my hand for the formal office handshake. And he won't <laughs> let me live that Because <laughs> I was so nervous and I, you know, I wanted to do a really good job. And more than anything, I just wanted a chance to meet these guys and play with these guys. So that's probably my most memorable moment so far. Yeah, well, they definitely found a great person and performer and human being in you, Mackenzie. You were wonderful. So, and you, and you um, said it right off the top. Absolutely. You're absolutely. a great person. Great person. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, and, I, I recall, too, uh-huh. I'm sorry not to butt in, but it's just a, just, yeah, a, just a thing about Mackenzie. I remember when, uh, you know, he was talking about his whole thing when he came in meeting out. And he when he started doing that song, Tony gave me that look with the hardware hang thumbs up and the eye <laughs> ring. Like, like, yeah, we got our man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you know, we it, it was that feeling like when you know you're looking for something and you hit the right button and you open the right door and the price is right and you go, oh man, let's make a deal. You pick door number one and the prize you don't get the donkey. So it was like, right. we, we knew we hit the right prize line, door number one, when, we, when that brother came in there and started singing. He was like, yep. That's it. Yep, we got it. We got it. <laughs> you know, it was that kind of feeling, you know. And so we felt real good. I mean, it was a good energy when it all happened. So we're just very grateful, man. We worked with some great singers in Kip Blackshire and, and Tamar and a lot of the singers. that we've been very fortunate to have some great singers work with us. And yeah. We just feel real good about McKenzie, you know. Yeah, you guys are all awesome. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, and you guys, I just want to talk to you a little bit about this too. I'm, I'm just thinking while you're talking, you, know, you guys have a great, you know, camaraderie about you guys. You guys get along perfectly. It's like a family. And so when you're not, you know, together and you're not in the studio, you're not doing anything involving, you know, music. You know, when you finally do get some time for yourself, and I mean, music is creative in itself. So you that might be your your peace and your release from from stress. But when you get some time to yourself, what's a day in your life like? Any hobbies or any um, interests that you guys, you know, do? <laughs> All right. I will go first because mine is really easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, music is my side hustle. I still got my day job. So I still work. I still, you know, come to work every day, and I work with, you know, uh, some fabulous people who allow me the opportunity to be able to uh, express myself artistically. Uh, as I didn't realize how, what a huge void that uh, performing or music had left in my life. Uh, when I when I left music, you know, again I became a uh, suburban dad, coaching my daughter in basketball, coaching my son in football and swimming. I mean, that was the life that I was living. You know what I mean? Until I got that phone call from Mo. Um, you know, to do the, uh, the celebration that we did at the Excel Center, I, I had totally left music a- alone. Um, so I had totally migrated myself and, again, took a real self-assessment. Uh, I was probably, like, early 30s, mid-30s, and just said, okay, I'm a black, I'm an African-American male with no college degree. How can I realistically get myself back into uh, 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 the workforce? And, you know, mm-hmm. took 10 jobs and worked my way up. And, again, it was a it was a hard look. It was a it was a realistic look, but it was something I did. So it's something that I cherish, you know, to this day is that I was able to make that transition. A lot of musicians don't make that transition and end up going down the wrong trail. But you know, yeah. uh, well, giving me the opportunity to to come back and and to do something that I really love doing, it's filled such a huge void for me. It's uh, it's, it's crazy. 
Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And what about you, Morris? What do you do when you finally have some time for yourself? Aside from you, you got any hobbies or things that you do for fun? Well, you know what? I, I, I love what I there, – there's not enough hours in the day, really, for what I do. I mean, and I, and I love music. I mean, it's what I do. It's my, it's my thing, tinkering with my computers and things of that nature. Uh, I, I love that. Uh, if I if I were to have a hobby, it probably would be something like a video or something like that. You know, because I, I, there's not enough time. There, there's so many things to figure out with software, with programs, and, and, and you know, and, and writing songs and things of that nature. And I have a project that I work on called World Symphony for Peace that I started working on a couple or a few years ago. That I'm, you know, that I'm just working at. And, and that's just about uh, bringing people together in different cultures, different, you know, walks of life through music. You know, it's kind of like if Anthony Bourdain, like that, only with music. That's kind of what I'm doing with this project. And, and so it's just stuff that that's still music-related because that's all I know to do, and I just love doing it. And, um, but, you know, I just always think of ways, like, well, how, how can we reach people? And that's what's great about the MPG. Prince wrote so many great songs, and, and, and uh, so many people love him and love what he did musically. Those songs will never die. They will never, as long as there's a planet Earth, Prince will be played in perpetuity. Yeah. Because he was prolific as a writer, he was prolific as a performer, and I think for us to work with him, and, you know, Tony wrote some of those songs. I mean, we wrote some of those songs together with him. And we played those songs and we recorded those songs with him. So it's like, you know, we're not some kind of like cover band. We're, we're the guys who did that work. And so as long as there's an audience for this music, and I, and I think if it's presented well, if we do very well and put it together, I think there will always be an audience for it as long as the music is respected and we do the best that we can do as performers to like make sure that, that the legacy don't suffer. From, mm-hmm. from uh, you know, not living up to the quality that we're used to and that the fans are used to, then I think as long as we can keep it in that level, I think we'll be all right. I think if, 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 if people don't feel the experience is, is that, then I think that could probably be uh, an issue. But I think as long as we can present it and, and perform it to the way that, that people understand it to be, because like, like Mackenzie said, you can't replace print. That is impossible. Right. You can't do it. And, and and you can't uh, do do anything that's gonna be like you know, we ain't having holograms. But, so the best we can do is represent this music as best that we can. And then also, from what he taught us, how to you know, Prince taught us a lot, and, and a lot whatever he didn't teach, you learn from watching. So we have to now, as a band, I believe, I think we just have to like pin our own songs and write our own things and 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 keep growing as a unit. Uh, and, and implementing the things that we learned from him. I mean, Prince used to tell me all the time, he says, man, I love how, look what Larry Graham did when he left, uh, you know, the sign of Family Stone. He was he got bigger hits than them, and like, they had some hits of his own. Like when he right. did Big Graham Central Station, he said, I want y'all to be like that, man. I want you to, like, go out, and when you're out of this band, and go do your own thing, and, and, and be like another hit. They had, Larry went right from Warner Brothers and got his own deal, and, uh, and was successful. And he wanted us to be like that. So he said, yeah, dude, you don't have to slow down because you're not in this particular situation. So we definitely want to do that. We want to write when that's what we are doing. I mean, Kenzie's got some great tunes. Tony's got some stuff we got to do. So we we, we in, the, we're in the lab. We're cooking it up. And yeah, I think we're going to have something that's going to be dope. And so yeah. uh, that's, I think that's what's next for us. And, and, as, and, and we try to continue to grow as artists and as musicians. And uh, that's what I think we're going to try to do. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, that's what you know. Yeah, definitely. And thank you, Morris. And what about what about you, Mackenzie? What, uh, what's something that you do um, a day in your life? What does it look like for you? I'm really boring. Um, <laughs> so you say boring? <laughs> music, right? Yeah, I'm really boring. Um, if I'm at a <laughs> studio, I'm playing somewhere, or I'm at a show studying someone that I admire. Um, it really does consume my life. And it's just, it's who I am. Like, people ask me what I do. I don't really know what to say because I don't look at music as something that I do. It's just something that I live. Um, but if I'm not 
currently in the booth or if I'm not at the show. I'm obsessed with movies, specifically sci-fi or anything that has to do with outer space or anything that has to do with magic or superheroes yeah, or anything like that. So yeah. I love Harry <laughs> Potter. Obviously, I love all the uh, the Marvel stuff, all the Avengers stuff. Um, I'll sit and watch movies back to back over and over. I'm just obsessed with them because I feel like it's the ultimate hodgepodge of all the creative mediums. You have music, you have visuals, you have art, you have everything all in one one arena. And when it's done right, it's, it's a magical thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's so true with the movie. It could take you somewhere um, in your mind and your imagination of just all all things come together. Absolutely. So thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Cool. I'm a sci-fi person, too. So I'm one of those people love who it. love, like, Black Mirror. Um, I love that series Absolutely. and things like that. They're so great. So, um, With the new Matrix yeah. coming out. A new Matrix, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. And um, I'm thinking, too, about you guys' this touring. You guys are touring now, and you're going to be traveling to numerous places like France and Belgium and Netherlands, United Kingdom, and that's going to be in December. So you're ending the year out really, really strong. What are some things that we can look forward to with um, MPG in 2020? You want to take that song? Well, like I said, oh, you got it, Mo. Well, like I said, I mean, I think the the, the thing right now that's pretty much facial that we want to make sure we do is get new music out. And, and 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 like I said, we're working on some things that I'm excited about, and uh, I think that's the next. So we can go and, and and play and and do those things, but I think it's, it's like at some point you have to have something new to offer up and something new to put in the pipeline, and so. We have the capability. Again, we we wrote some of those songs that, that you know Tony <laughs> penned some hits. I mean, yeah. bona fide hits that he penned. And you know, Prince called him the best fan in in the Midwest and in the in the area. You know, you know what I'm saying? Tony was the he was the he in the game with the rest of the cats that y'all doing it at that time. So all of that's still there. So we want to put all of that to use and like uh, get that pen out and get that get these vocals out and get this music. Because that's what we are. That's what we did. We allowed us to do that. Now we have the opportunity to do it ourselves, and so we have to take the opportunity to do it. I think that's really a, a big part of what it is that we uh, want to do or need to do. And um, we set expression, and then give us like something that they can like. I said, okay, now we got some new stuff. Teaching these cats, and and try to do the best we can. And like I said, live up to. I, I don't. I will waste no time. Trying to like beat Prince and that dude, there's, there's, there's only one of them cats that comes around. You like got Michael Jackson, you got Prince, you got just like some, some cats who just come every once in a blue moon. And it's just that period in time when those guys were born, it's like that was a magical time in world history because there was a lot of people that kind of like was in that era, right? In that era right there that just came just like. From, from heaven somewhere and just, it just placed us on this planet. And I'm fortunate that we had a chance to, like, I've I, I never worked with Michael Jackson. I can't keep the show that we did. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, you know, I never worked with him, but I had a lot of respect for Michael. Prince had a lot of respect for Michael and a lot of love for Michael. He was devastated when he passed away. And, um, and, and just to have all of that kind of energy around us, man, the, the people that it was always, Prince and Mike was my heroes, man. It's like a million, a million years would have thought I would have met these cats. And so it's just was like, that's the kind of thing that's like, man, you can't repeat that. You can't duplicate it. But what you can do is do the best you can, to, you know, with the, with the knowledge that you gain, what you gain from being with a master, and then apply that, you know. And I think uh, we have the ability to do that. Yes, I, I definitely do too. I mean, it, it's clear that, you are all very passionate about what you're doing um, with the music as part of who you are. And kind of like what um, I read something <clears throat> about um, McKenzie, and I'm going to get to that. But being that, you know, part of what I'm talking about here has to do with music and being moved by the music, that's one of my segments. You know, how how are each of you actually moved by music, moved by the music that you make, or music that you hear, for instance, Mackenzie, I had read that uh, Purple Rain was one of the first songs that he heard from Prince and how it, 
evoke the same kind of spiritual feeling that he got from listening to gospel. I mean, music is highly emotive and it conjures up all kinds of emotions and feelings inside of us. So how are each of you personally moved by the music? I mean, I think that's, for me, what you just said is kind of it. Um, I'm all about energy and I'm a very spiritual person. So I won't say that all music is created equally, but I do feel like fundamentally if you come from a pure place, your music is going to strike a chord in someone. Um, and I've always just gravitated towards music that made me feel. Now, what exactly do I feel? I feel like that varies on what I'm listening to. There's songs that I always go back to for different moments. If I ever want to calm myself down, I'll put on Overjoyed by Stevie Wonder. There's something about the chord progression in the beginning of the song that just puts me in a trance. It doesn't matter what's going on. doesn't matter what kind of stress I have. It just calms me down. If I want to get hyped before a show, I put on some Marvin Gaye, some of his stuff from the 80s, um, just, you know, the stuff that just had that drum machine going with his smooth vocals over it, and that gets me dancing, that gets me hyped. And then, you know, I listen to music. If I just want to study, I might put on a James Brown tape and just watch hours of footage. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that it moves me, you know, mm-hmm. in and through life. Um, that's a deep question. <laughs> 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 we can talk about that all day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, though, and how you um, – you listen to certain things to get you um, in the mood for certain things that are going on in your life or calming you down or hyping you up because that's what music does. Essentially, you know, we right. can hear a song and it can take us back 10 years, you know, that exact Absolutely. moment when it happened, you know. Absolutely. So it's definitely powerful. So thank you for sharing that, Mackenzie. And what about you, Morris? Um, how are you moved by the music in general on a personal level? Well, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. Music, George Clinton said it best. He said, music can move or it can be moved. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, it's, 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 it's just music. That's, it's always been, think about it. It is a powerful force. It is the one thing that everybody uses. It's like, I only know like maybe a handful of people who are not affected by music. Like, my dad probably did one, but everybody. <laughs> No matter what your situation was, you know, how bad your day was, they would come on and put their music on and move. It's a time machine. It's a teleporter. It transports you somewhere, you know? So think about it. Or you can, if you play some songs, they're, they're, they're time stamps in your life. And, mm-hmm. and when you play certain songs, you just go right back to those moments. You hear a song like, yeah! And you <laughs> right. go right on the time machine, right back to when that was, because it moved you. Some mm-hmm. people lock into an era. Like they had music that they listen to, but they still listen to it. Don't try right. to hear this on the radio right now. I'm not trying to they just pull out their old CDs or their old tapes or whatever it is and they with it. They just lock into that era. And that's because music did something to them at a point and, and a lot of times with everything that's going on, stress and Trump and whatever the case may be, politics and you know, everything going on in the world. Music is that place where you can go to the, the, the escape. It is the, the, the island, the refuge, and the, the fortress of solitude. And that's what it is to me. I, I, music is a transporter. And, and when I go into there and I'm either creating or just sitting in my, you know, I used to have a library uh, uh, of just music. Well, I still do, I think. I, 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 the thing is, I would sit and just listen and understand, like, just try to dissect and get in the DNA mm-hmm. of, like, how it was constructed. Like, what did they use? How did they make that? How did they, you know, listen to the mix, like, listen to where the strings are, listen to where the vocals are. And there's art to all of the angles of music that, that I would listen to. I can't go watch a movie now. Uh, even, and I'm not going to kill you. I love, like, sci-fi and Avengers but I can't not watch a movie and not listen to the music score. I can't not right. be like, oh, how did they do that right there? Oh, that's because that, if you, you know, it's been a thing down there, you know, people put a movie up and play it without the, the soundtrack. It is a completely different experience when you watch a scene with no music in there and you put that tension with the music in there. It changes know, everything. Yes, yes, yes. Score is so and important. that's because music it has that thing that moves you. <clears throat> and if you and if you're fortunate enough to know how to do to summon that up. That's why the cats who, who work all the time, they figured it out. 
and they know how to fuck up and make sure that that you feel that emotion. Hans Zimmer and, and cats like this, you know, that, that like works on that stuff, they get it. They know that music can change the entire scene. And when they put it in there, it's just a thing that you jump out the seat or go to crying because the strings happen right when this happened, and then the tears start running. You know, it's because That's it right. connects the people because it's a vibration, and we feel vibration. And so when we play the right chords and we play, I'm telling you, people that didn't even know music, he let uh, Cassandra uh, O'Neill get one of them chords. She hit, boy, everybody neck get crooked. They were, ooh. They were there <laughs> right. Like right. Everybody neck get crooked because she hit something that resonates with people. That's right. And we are all creatures that are, like, put together by frequency and by molecular frequency, like everything vibrates at a certain pattern. And that's why when you scratch a chalkboard, everybody universally just go, because that don't resonate with our frequency. It, it's right. a, it, it fights against, it pushes against our frequency. But when something's pleasing and pleasant, it works with our, uh, our, our frequency that we are constructed out of. And, and, and not to get too deep with it, but that's the kind of thing that interests me. And when we talk about, like, figuring out, like, what are those tones? What are the, what are the things that, like, do and, and make you feel a certain kind of way? That's the kind of stuff I think we have to, to understand. That is awesome. And I'm glad that you said that, too, about how music is a vibration because – I have a four-year-old, just turned four, and he will hear a song and say, you know, Mama or, or Daddy, you know, that that sounds really nice. I like that. Or, you know what, Mama, that that's sad. I don't want to hear that song. He can actually feel the emotion in the music, too, and he's able to pick that that's up. And he's, been, he's done that for so long. And he'll get teary-eyed when something sad comes on, and he, he's just very in tune to that. And music is, like I said, it's something that really, it just moves through all of us. It's so powerful, so powerful. Hey, think about that. Let's think about that. And and, and, and and there's even, I've seen on YouTube, like these small kids. So, like, like they got all kinds of these videos. They just turn on, like the kids would be crying or be asleep, and they turn the track on there, wake up, and go right in the mode. And they yeah. have baby kids. <laughs> yeah. And they go right in the, like, oh, yeah, that's the crazy shark song. And they will turn a flip <laughs> on the little shark song. And, and it's like, that's true. because again, that is like wired in the, uh, like nobody, I mean, you didn't teach him that. That's something that's in, it's in, it's in him. That's he right. feels that vibration and he knows it rubs me a certain way, either the good way or the bad way. Yeah, and, yeah, and he very can articulate true. that and say, yeah, I ain't feeling that right here, Mama. <laughs> and, and, and it's like that's fascinating to me that, that kids have that ability to know that something ain't rubbing them the right way. Is they not that's feeling right. Good. And, that, and, that, and the funny thing is, not everybody knows me. They don't know that you're flat or sharp. All they know is they neck got like, oh, yeah. get that look like a <laughs> like dog when they don't understand what you're saying. And yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's like, you know, what role? Uh, you know, <laughs> you know and, and you know it's like it ain't right. You don't know why it ain't right. You just know that it's well, not. No, right. it's not. <laughs> like, yeah, my, mom, my mom used to say, yeah, baby, they got. My grandma would say, yeah, they got too many quadros on. She made up her own words, but like there's something that's not right. Like, yeah, you got too many quadros going up there right now. So, oh, you know, that's so funny. It's, it's, it's that kind of thing, isn't it? you know? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That that really was. Um, that's, that's key, though. That is key for people when um, they hear something. It's something that can bring people together, something that can, like I was saying earlier, can um, put us in a certain mood and take us back. I mean, years, you know, mm-hmm. one song has the power to do that. And, um, yeah. Tony, what about you? How are you moved by the music? Um, I, I think everybody's kind of kind of said it already. I mean, uh, yeah. From an early age, I mean, music just moves me. I, you know, I, it's in my body. I've been able to, you know, I'm able to to move to a beat and you know, and and, and do things. And so, uh, you know, as you said earlier, you know, songs take you back. It's a soundtrack, you know, of your life basically. You can go back to certain phases. I mean, to this day, you know, uh, if uh, a one left fail by the fifth dimension comes on i you know i know where i was and and when that song comes on it takes me back to that time you know uh the first time i heard uh maggot brain or flashlight i i I know what i was doing at that particular time so for me uh music it's 
it's universal. So uh-huh. one of the things that hit me the most uh, or hit me, this smacked me in the face, is touring with Prince. And uh, we're in Japan. We're in uh, uh, Germany. It doesn't matter where we're at. These people cannot speak a lick of English, but they can sing every lyric. <laughs> word for word. Yeah. Yeah, to them songs. Yeah. Right? So, you know, yeah. So, you know, it's the, it's the universal language. Uh, yeah. It's music. Yes. Yeah, definitely so. That reminds me. I used to live in Japan. I lived in Japan for seven years, uh, back wow. and forth between Tokyo wow. and uh, and yeah. Okinawa. I also lived in Norway and, and London. And I noticed with, with Jap- Japan especially, um, their stores stay open really, really late at night. Their clothing stores or whatever. And you can walk that's in the they store. Work in the, that's because they're working them employees to 11 and to midnight. They, you they do. To do <laughs> they, they do. And you can go in the store, too, and they will be blasting, like, American music. It could be rap. It could be country. It could be whatever. And yeah. you know, they'll be singing it, yeah. but they can't, they can't speak to you, like, in a dialogue in, in English, right. yeah. but they, they know they, every they get, single word. They can maybe take those words. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, that's fascinating to me, fascinating. So thank you guys for sharing that um, with me, how you guys are moved by the music. So Morris Hayes, Tony M., and Mackenzie, you are all incredible, incredible, incredible musicians who are touching the world with your gifts. And it's been a real pleasure speaking with the three of you today on the phone. Thank you so much for having us on. Thank you so much. Yeah, we appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much.